Uh, if you would all please find your notes. Uh, we want to do something a little differently this morning in case anybody is living on another planet and doesn't know today is Super Bowl Sunday. So let's start with a little Super Bowl quiz. Question number one. Tickets to the first Super Bowl range between A, six and twelve dollars, B, twelve and eighteen dollars, C, eighteen and twenty-five dollars, and B, twenty-five and fifty dollars. How many of you think it's A? Okay, got a couple hands, three hands. How many of you think it's B, twelve to eighteen? A few more hands. C, eighteen to twenty-five? A few more hands. D, 25 to 50. Ah, uh, there's where we have our biggest answer. And the actual correct answer is A, 6 to 12 dollars. Were you there? I was the only one who got it right. No, this is the first Super Bowl. No, 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 this is the first Super Bowl, guys. Actually, the last question is about what the cheapest ticket is today. We'll get to that in a second. Question number two. How many pounds of guacamole are consumed on Super Bowl Sunday? Is it A, 450,000 pounds, two, two, or B, 2 million pounds, C, 4 million pounds, or D, 8 million pounds? How many of you think it's 450,000 pounds? You are correct. It is more than 450,000. How many of you think it's B, 2 million? Okay, you've got several hands there. C, 4 million. Oh, wow, that's that's a popular or D eight million. A few brave souls, and you are right. It is eight million pounds of guacamole will be consumed today in the United States. <laughs> okay. Question number three of the ten most watched TV programs in the U.S. So this is in U.S. history. How many were Super Bowls? Is it A zero? B, 2, C, 6, or D, 9? How many of you think it's A, 0? You are correct. It is, there's, that's not correct. B, how many of you think it's 2? 1. How many of you think it's 6? Six? 6 of the top 10. Okay, that's a little more popular. How many of you think it's 9 of the top 10? The correct answer is D, 9 of the top 10 all-time watched shows in the United States. Super Bowls. Question number four. What NFL team has played in four Super Bowls but never led in any game? Is it A, the Cardinals, B, the Vikings, C, the Rams, or D, the Steelers? How many of you think it's the Cardinals? Okay. How many think it's B, the Vikings? Okay, several votes there. How many think it's C, the Rams? You've already voted. Okay. How many of you think it's D, the Steelers? Oh, okay, the correct answer is, what is it, Gerald? I think it's B. Vikings, it is. Okay, now, you have to remember answer number one when we go to question number five. Remember, first Super Bowl tickets range between $6 and $12. The cheapest tickets today available to the Super Bowl cost how much? How many of you think it's A, $450? This is the cheapest ticket. Real ticket, not scalping. No, no, not scalp tickets. This is the cheapest real ticket to the Super Bowl. Okay, I saw one hand for $450. Dal, I hate to tell you, you're wrong. It is one of the last three answers. How many of you think it's B, $1,700? Oh, I see several hands there. This is the cheapest. C, $2,200. Oh, there's where we get the, there's where we get most votes. How many think it's D, $2,700? I see two hands, and they are correct. $2,700 is the cheapest ticket way up in the nosebleed section. That's the cheapest tickets. So all I've got to say is, <laughs> I think Kelly and I aren't going to go this year. We've been there all. No, Joe. <laughs> I can't imagine spending $2,700 to sit in the nosebleed section. And 
I was going to do the most expensive, but the numbers were all over the place. But I think the most expensive ticket is a little over fifty thousand oh dollars. <laughs> Let's see. I don't think so. <laughs> now, why did I start with that? Listen, to, listen to my transition now because this is key. None of the things I just said. They're all true, but none of them really matter. They're just interesting. In fact, how many of you are just really, really big Super Bowl fans? Big football fans? Okay, you got two or three. Okay, very good. Uh, people forget all this stuff. Does anybody remember who won the Super Bowl five years ago in 2012? Linda, any idea? Justin? New England is a really, really good guess because they've won so many times, but that's not correct. Five years ago, it was won by the New York Giants. My point is simply this. Most of us will watch the game today. Some of us merely for the commercials. And the guacamole. <laughs> I didn't throw this one in, but did you know people consume more calories on Super Bowl day than any other day of the year except Thanksgiving? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. None of that stuff really matters, and five years from now, what seems so important today will be insignificant. It'll be a footnote in history. But the things we're going to be talking about today are really big. God is going to communicate through Paul what's really important. And what's really important is that we understand who Jesus is and who he has called us to be. If you have found Philippians 2, we're going to read the first 12 verses, excuse me, the first 11 verses. And so if you would, please follow along and let's see what Paul has to say to us through the inspiration of the Lord. He said, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate that make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with one mind and purpose? Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Would you pray with me and then we'll begin our study. God, thank you for all the wonderful things you share about yourself in this passage and the way you challenge us to be like you. Speak to each of us, God. Let us hear from you today. In your name we pray. Amen. Paul begins by telling us this, and if you're taking notes, this is the first point in your notes. He begins by telling us the importance of working together. He says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship of the Spirit, or your heart's tender and compassionate? Then make, my, make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly. He begins by talking about the importance of us loving one another and working together. This is a letter of encouragement, but there is probably a little hint here of Paul pointing out that everything is not really perfect in the church in Philippi. Churches, because they are made up of people, are never perfect. Don't, those of you who come regularly, you love our church family, don't you? We, we have a really wonderful fellowship. I've pastored for 35 years, and honestly, this is the easiest congregation I've ever pastored. I, we, we don't have people that try to cause trouble. People get along. 
I mean, there's there's not a drama that I've been in other some other churches, and there was frequently drama because people were fussing and dealing with one another. Now, does that mean this is a perfect church? No, of course not. Churches are not perfect because they're made of people, made up of people, and none of us are perfect. So even the best of churches is less than perfect. And Paul ultimately is probably making a subtle point that things were not perfect at Philippi either. Not everybody got along. But he was wanting them to understand that unity was a really, really big deal. In fact, look at the next statement in your notes. The church has many things going for it, but it is unity. Church is based on the word ecclesia, and the word Greek word ecclesia means called out ones. God has called us to work together as a church family. As the Philippians did, what Paul challenged them to do, they could experience unity. They had brought much joy to Paul already, but in verse 2 he tells them what they had to do to make him even happier. He says that they can wholeheartedly agree with one another. They can love one another. They can work together. And last but not least, they can be of one mind and one purpose. Now, does that mean we're always going to think exactly the same? Of course not. Even those we love sometimes have differences of opinion. That's okay. But I want you to notice what makes the difference. It's verse 3. He says, don't be, what's that next word? Don't be selfish. How many of you have a tendency to be selfish? We all do. It's human nature. You know who I think of first, if I'm not really, really careful? Me. Who, who said me? Joe? I'm, Joe, I don't think it'd be first. I'm sorry. <laughs> My natural inclination is to think first of me. Anybody else able to relate? It's kind of human nature. I have to guard against that so that I'm not doing things just on what's good for Tim Richards. Paul's concern wasn't that we would be too unselfish. His concern was that we would do what comes naturally. Because let's be honest, being selfish is natural, isn't it? Uh, I have five children. I didn't have to teach any of them to be selfish. And it's not a put down of them. It's the same with every person I've ever met. We all have that natural tendency to look out for self. This repetition of the theme of unity is intended to make the point and understand what's required. In fact, 26 of the times this word one mind is used in the New Testament. Of the 26 times, 10 of those uses are found in the four chapters of Philippians. We all have differences of opinions and ideas, but when it comes to the big stuff, we must focus on the right things. We must have unity. We must be willing to work together. Not because we are all identical or all think exactly the same way, but we need to be willing to love one another even when we don't agree. And when each of us does our part, we'll see God's work done. Working together, we get so much more done than we can work and get things done separately. Next statement. This is a quote by a woman by the name of Vesta Kelly. She said, Snowflakes are one of nature's most fragile things, but just look at what they can do when they stick together. <clears throat> Traffic jams, closed airports, you getting stuck at home for days, power down. I mean, all kinds of things are done by the insignificant little snowflakes because there's so many of them, and as she said, they just stick together. That brings us to the second main principle in the message. Paul continues by telling us the importance of Jesus' example. Now, Jesus' selfless attitude is to be our example, and I love the fact that Paul doesn't merely challenge to have humility, he demonstrates what it looks, looks like by showing us how humble Jesus was. In many ways, this passage is one of the greatest theological thoughts in all of Scripture. It deals with how God views himself and what he did when he was here on earth. 
In fact, Paul's not the least bit subtle when challenging us with Jesus' example. He begins by saying, you must have the same attitude that Jesus had. Think about that. Really, his point was, kind of along the lines of the title of the message, what would Jesus do? Remember those bracelets that became the rage about eight or ten years ago? WWJD? Everybody, not everybody, but many, many people were wearing those. And it was a wonderful challenge, but here Paul basically originates that idea. But think about Jesus. When God came to earth, where did he arrive? What was the name of the little town? Bethlehem. Big or small? Small. Where was he born in Bethlehem? In the stable. What was his first bed in that first nursery? Major feeding trough. Were his parents well-to-do and well-connected? No. When Jesus came, he, God in the flesh, came to the most humble, lowly situation imaginable. That was the point. Paul was pleading with the Philippians to live in harmony, to shed their ambitions and pride, and to have a selfless desire to serve, which was the essence of Jesus' life. And when it comes right down to it, look at this next statement. Paul wasn't discussing theological truth when he talked about Jesus. He was demonstrating the importance of humility. Now notice the statement at the end of verse 6 when Paul says, Jesus didn't think of Think of re he didn't regard equality with God as something to cling to. Question. When you understand the Trinity, that is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three God, okay, which one's higher than the others? Well, ultimately there is such perfect unity there that there is not a, there's not a power struggle going on because the three are in perfect harmony. But when Jesus was here, did he demand that everyone recognize he was God? He was God, but he didn't demand that people acknowledge that. Paul, in fact, says that Jesus humbled himself. The emphasis moves from Jesus' nature to his attitude. He wasn't merely brought low by the nature and circumstances of his birth and life. Jesus lowered himself even to death on the cross. The closer Jesus came to his crucifixion, the more he took on the role of a servant leader. You find him determinedly heading to Jerusalem, even though he knew that is where he would die. We see him washing the disciples' feet, even though they should have been clamoring to wash his. And this wasn't a brand new thing in Jesus' attitude. This was the way Jesus operated from day one. He didn't cease to be God. But he didn't act like we would think God would act. He came. He loved. He served. He had the right to demand that others serve him, but that's not what he did. Just think about this next statement, which is in your notes. Before coming to earth, Jesus was the creator. In fact, Ephesians 1 talks about <coughs> Jesus was creator. And while he was on earth, what was he? Yes, he was a teacher. But what was Jesus' job for most of his life? He was a carpenter. Now, nothing wrong with being a carpenter. Let me be very clear about that. But if you think about someone who's going to literally change the world, how many of you think first of a carpenter? He was God. He came to us. And instead of choosing to come as a king or as a prince or even as a priest, and I know theologically he was a priest, I understand, but that's not how he earned his living. He earned his living as a carpenter. He gave up everything. Most of you have heard the name Leonard Bernstein before. You know who he is? former conductor of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. Someone once asked Leonard Bernstein, what is the most difficult instrument to play? 
Guess what Bernstein said? Second fiddle. He said you can get all kinds of people who will devote all kinds of attention when they are first chair. That's the most important, the one who does the solo part. <coughs> but he said getting someone to approach second chair or third chair or fourth chair with the same passion that the first person in the first chair devotes is always a challenge. Because if we're up front, we kind of want to look good. <coughs> but those who are willing to be just as passionate about serving God when they're not up front, that's the real test. Jesus came. He identified as a servant. Let's, let's go to the third point in the message this morning. Let's talk about the results of Jesus' faithfulness. Now, there's a reward for faithfully serving God in the shadows. There will come a time when the one who sees the godly things you do in private will reward you openly. And who is the one who always sees what you do in private and who will ultimately reward you openly? Who would that be? God. Exactly. In fact, notice the words of these three verses. Let's just read verses 9, 10, and 11 if you've still got your Bibles open. Therefore, because he was obedient to God and died on the cross... Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul writes that God exalted Jesus above every name imaginable because he was a servant. He didn't deserve to be. He didn't have to be. Ironically, if you're just thinking of what's right and fair, he shouldn't have been, but he was. What happened with Jesus is part of a principle that has significant implications for Christians. We aren't to promote ourselves. We're to humbly serve God. Consider the words of James 4.10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. It's only through humility that we can live up to what God wants us to do and wants to do through us. Look at the next statement. When we humble ourselves, we open the door for God to exalt us. You know, you can promote yourself, and you'll get only what self-promotion will get you. But if you do your faithful best to serve God as a servant, and serve others as a servant, God is the one that comes alongside and recognizes you. Before the time of Christ, humility was not considered a virtue. It was considered a sign of weakness. We're kind of back to that stage in the United States at this point. Everybody today emphasizes self-esteem. And let me say, I'm not against self-esteem. But what I've observed happening with many of our young people, self-esteem gets emphasized so much that they think they're better than they are. A generation ago, Many people knew that they didn't know a lot of things. Now, when I'm around a lot of kids, they think they know kind of everything. It, I, I'm not opposed to having healthy self-esteem. But as he's emphasizing humility, and let me give you my definition of humility, and this is on the, this is on the mark. Humility is simply seeing yourself the way God sees you. No better, no worse. And the reality is, and I say this regularly, we're all a mess. Every single one of us. We are also valuable enough that if we had been the only one on earth, Jesus would have still come and died for us. So we have infinite worth, and yet we're a mess. Both are realities. And Paul, as he talks about that, when, when we place ourselves in a position of humbly serving God, God uses us. We must remain faithful as we humbly serve him. I came across some great perspective from some famous people from the past. Some of you have heard the name D.L. Moody. He was the Billy Graham of the late 1800s and early 1900s. This was his take on humility. He said, be humble or you'll stumble. Very catchy. Winston Churchill knew how to think, how to not think more highly of himself than he ought to. He was once asked, doesn't it thrill you to know that every time you make a speech, the hall is packed to overflowing? Churchill replied, it's quite flattering, 
But whenever I feel that way, I always remember that if instead of making a political speech, I was being hanged, the crowd would be twice as big. <laughs> remember the words of President John F. Kennedy? Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. <laughs> Simply put, it's not all about us. Final statement in your notes. <clears throat> God can do more through us than we imagine if we want Him to get the credit. That's the point. Your attitude toward God and our church and those around us can make all the difference. When the famous English architect Sir Christopher Wren was supervising the construction of a magnificent cathedral in London, a journalist thought it would be interesting to interview different workers on the job site and see how they approach their job. Listen to the differences. The first man who was interviewed was asked, what are you doing? And he replied, I'm cutting stone for 10 shillings a day. Second was asked the same question. And he replied, I'm putting in 10 hours a day on this job. But the third was asked the same question and his response was totally different. He said, I'm helping Sir Christopher Wren construct one of London's greatest cathedrals. What are you doing tomorrow? Oh, I know, you'll be doing different things. You'll be doing your job. I understand. But you will be doing more than that. You have the opportunity tomorrow to be humbly playing a role in the greatest kingdom the world has ever known. <coughs> one that is eternal, not temporary. So whatever, whatever you're doing, whether you're teaching a class, laying bricks, delivering mail, selling things, taking care of children, or whether you're going grocery shopping. No matter what you are doing tomorrow, do it the way Jesus would do it, with humility and an attitude of service. Would you pray with me, please? God, help us to be like you, to serve you, to follow you passionately, to be willing to be servants at heart. God, thank you that you let, let us have the opportunity and privilege to follow you that way. In Jesus' name we pray.